Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner. About a year or so ago, I created a video discussing the difference in measurement techniques and how that relates to a house curve that many people will use to tune either their home audio system or their car audio system. And I think I kind of missed the opportunity to really hammer home the point I was trying to make. So I thought I would create this video as a follow-up to try to do that. Now, what do I mean about different measurement methods? Well, primarily there are three measurement methods. The first one in car audio is used quite frequently, and that is to take a microphone, hold it in front of your face. Usually we'll lean the seat back to kind of put the microphone in the typical headspace. And then you play RTA pink noise and you move the microphone around the headspace, you know, various ways. That would be the first method, and that's just typically referred to as the moving microphone method. This can be done in car audio, but typically it's not. This is usually used in home theater or home audio situations. But you would put the microphone on a little stand and you would move it around the headspace area, usually within one cubic foot, you know, up, down, left, right, front to back. This would also be referred to as a moving microphone method because the microphone is moving in real time as the signal pink noise is being played. The other method that is often used is just to provide a spectrum sweep. And that would be where you place a static mic here and then you run a sign sweep, then you move it to the side and you run a sign sweep. That's typical if you're trying to do uh, actual measurements and trying to get a real feel for what a loudspeaker is doing. But it's less useful in my opinion in a home theater setting or a car audio setting it is also uh, different because the stimulus itself is not the same. It's not pink noise, it is a sign sweep. Now with that said, I wanna focus on the first two methods. Both of those are the moving microphone methods. With the moving microphone method, a lot of times people will use a house curve and overlay it on the in-room measured response and then use that to EQ to their target liking. I've seen all sorts of curves. You can go online and you can find various curves that people have come up with on their own, taking a typical baseline type curve and then tweaking it to their heart's content. The problem when you introduce a house curve into the moving microphone method, specifically when your body is in a position, is this. House curves aren't designed, typically, for a body to be in the place. Now, why does that matter? Well, your body influences the response that you measure in the seated position. And that's something that should come, you know, logically to most people, but a lot of people kind of forget that aspect. The physical size and placement of your body not only affects the response, because as you can imagine, if you weren't in the seated position and you were just measuring the microphone in quote free space at the listening position, you know, from behind the seat or something like that on a boom, then obviously, you don't have all of this extra girth consuming your space, uh, creating reflections, creating absorption patterns and that kind of thing. But not only that, the fact that you're holding the microphone, your arm is gonna be a boundary that can influence the response, creating reflections. Your shirt sleeve can create reflections or certain absorption at the wavelength is low enough or your shirt is thick enough. You can also have issues from your head. I mean, you've got a physical distance of the microphone to your nose, your face, your chest. And when you move the microphone around, you also get the effect of head shadowing. Well, head shadowing, what does that mean? Well, let's pretend like you're the speaker and you're playing a sine wave or you're playing pink noise or you're playing music. Now, if I'm looking directly at you, the signal is pure. When I turn to the side and I put the microphone over here to my other ear, well, now the signal is being blocked by all of my face. That's head shadowing, that's basically it. So as you can imagine, in a home theater, it's not really that big of a deal because all the speakers are pretty much, you know, in line with the microphone that you're measuring. However, in car audio, head shadowing is a, is a real problem. So imagine, for example, you're in your car, you're in the driver's position. Typically what you find is the driver's side speakers are gonna be in the door, the cell panel, or, or even maybe even the dash, and then the right side speakers are same thing. But what you'll almost always have is the relative angle from you to the driver's side speakers are usually somewhere in the neighborhood of, I don't know, maybe 10 to 
20 degrees off axis, meaning that you're not looking directly at them. They're a little bit of an angle off to you. But on the passenger side speaker, they're at a greater angle. Sometimes it's, you know, 30 degrees. Sometimes it's as much as 60 degrees. Now, what does that mean to you, the listener? Well, in car audio, much different environment than home audio. Again, the, the speakers are always at different angles, different locations. So in car audio, it's very, very paramount to match your left and right speaker. Whereas in home audio, usually you have symmetry already. You have your speaker angles are the same, the distances are the same. You don't really have to worry about matching left and right speakers. You certainly can, but you don't have to like you do in car audio, which introduces its own set of problems. Now let's take an example. In the United States, your driver's side position is the left side of the car. If you're trying to tune the left side speakers, you can pretty much guarantee that the sound arriving to your left ear is going to be pretty close to the sound that's arriving to your right ear because there's not as much head shadowing coming from a lower incidence angle. I mean, if you're about 10 degrees, 15 degrees off, that's not a big deal. Now, I'm not saying they're going to be the same. I'm saying they're going to be closer to the same. Thing is, when you go to your right side speakers where the incidence angle is a lot larger, a lot of the information that's hitting your right ear, especially in high frequency, is not going to hit your left ear because you're getting all of that sound coming from over here being blocked by your big old noggin and it's not getting to your left ear other than via reflections. So you've really got to keep that in mind when you're trying to tune left and right speakers separately in car audio, especially if you're trying to match a target curve with your body in the seated position. In my experience, that's a really dangerous area to get into and you really need to be cognitive of that. And since the head related transfer function starts to begin at around one to two kilohertz. And again, relative to the angle of the speaker itself, the higher in frequency you go, the more dramatic the effect becomes. So you've really got to pay attention to that kind of issue. Okay, now that you've gotten all that precursor, I'm going to give you some real life examples. I'm not going to do this in my car because it's really cold outside and I don't feel like going to sit in the garage, but I'm going to do this in my home theater and I'm gonna do the moving microphone method in the seated position, and then I'm gonna jump back there, I'm gonna hold the mic on a boom, and I'm gonna measure basically the same way, but with my body out of the seat in one and with my body in the seat in the other, and I'm going to overlay the results, and I'm gonna show you the actual effect of your body being in the seated position. Before I begin measuring, I'm gonna note that for my in-seated measurements, I'm using the microphone pointed straight up because doing it like this is kind of a pain in the butt. And in order to do that, I'm also going to use the 90 degree calibration file that comes with this microphone. So when I move to the back of this seat, I'm also going to be pointing the mic straight up just so it's more of an apples to apples comparison because the response will fall off when you change the microphone pointed forward versus 90 degrees. And since this is more of a comparison test, I want to make sure that the comparison is made as apples to apples as it can be. Now, with that said, I'm also using REW, I am using 148 octave, I'm using signal length of 64K, and I'm using averages set to quote forever. And I'm gonna just wave the microphone around in front of my face and kick this party off. So first of all, I need to play the pink noise. This is pseudo pink noise. I tend to focus this as my first set of measurements and I do this for a little bit longer, and then I kind of stretch out the envelope a little bit to get more of the head area. Uh, and now what I'll do is, that was the first test, and just kind of as a secondary first test, I'm going to lean the seat back and I'm going to measure around, just so we can kind of look at the differences between when you are moving the microphone a little bit too far forward versus when you are having the microphone placed in the head area when you are listening, okay? And with that measurement being completed, now I can move to the back behind this seat and get my body out of the seat and we can see what happens when you measure it closer to free space. All right, here we are with the three measurements that I've taken previously, all three of them shown here, but I'm gonna clear them out first and I'm gonna bring them in one by one. The first one is the first measurement that I took where I was sitting upright in the seated position, holding the mic, waving it in front of my face. The second one that I'm going to show you now is the second measurement that I took with me sitting in the seated position, 
holding the mic in front of my face, but I was actually leaned back in the seat. That way it put the mic more closely in the actual headspace area. And if we just compare those two right now, what we can see is for the most part, the response is pretty close to the same. And we were looking at a 5 dB scale here on the Y axis. But what we see as well is above about 100 Hertz to about two kilohertz, there is some variation in the response anywhere from plus or minus two to three dB. And it just kind of shifts a little bit depending on where you are. So for example, at about 300 Hertz to 400 Hertz, the body upright is about plus two dB versus me leaning back in the seat. And then if you just go to the next octave, really, you're at about plus five dB with me leaning back in the seat versus being upright in the seat. So there's a pretty decent change there. And then when you get above that, you're seeing some other uh, swings as well due to, I would can only assume, uh, cone filtering from the body. Now I'm going to bring in the free space measurement, which was the measurement where I was holding on to a boom with the mic attached to the end of the boom. And that's going to be here in blue. Now we can see again that that free space measurement is, for the most part, pretty close to the other one. So it's actually not as not as varied as I expected it was going to be, but there still is variance here, namely in this 100 hertz to 200 hertz region. I mean, you're about, uh, that's around 5 dB down in response from the other two in seated measurements. And then if you go a little bit higher, you can see the real difference above about eight kilohertz, nine kilohertz. And the response is anywhere from one to two dB higher with your body not being in the seat. So with you holding the microphone in free space, the response actually increases a little bit on the top end. That's something that I normally see. And I would actually think that is going to be more exaggerated when you are in the car audio environment, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But suffice it to say, when the microphone is hidden or... Yeah, when the microphone is hidden behind one ear relative to a speaker from the other side. So let's shut down the body back, or actually we'll shut down the body upright because I'm assuming that most people when they measure in the seated position are holding the mic in front of them, but they're leaned back. Most people I see do that. So we'll just compare those two to make things a little bit easier here. And again, you see the same kind of trend where the response is varied, plus or minus one, maybe two, three dBD, plus or minus two, three, oh my gosh, plus or minus two or three dB. And then we can see here that the response is varied again, about plus or minus two to maybe three dB above 100 Hertz to about two, three kilohertz. But then you also see some little shifts here. Now that's really in the minutia and I don't know, you know, how often that's going to cause an issue for most people. But again, this gets back to the point of, let's say you had a target curve that you were trying to hit with, with this response. So you were EQing until you couldn't EQ anymore. What kind of changes are necessary and what kind of changes are not necessary? Well, you don't know until you get in, uh, into the car or into the seated position in your living, living room, your listening room, your home theater, and you start listening and you try to correlate the measurements with what you hear. And that's really the point here is that I, I really want to make it clear that you can measure in different ways and you can get different results. And, and that's what we're seeing here. The body certainly impacts the response uh, and the degree varies depending on what frequency you're talking about. But the bottom line is that the body being in the seated position does have an effect and it's plus or minus maybe two, three dB. And if you're you know, making corrections on one and you're making corrections on, on the other frequency, you may actually have a flip-flop. Maybe you should have gone the other way around, but you don't know because that's part of the measurement process is making adjustments and then listening and trying to figure out what works best. Measurements are now done and we've got a plethora of information. A what? A plethora. What we can tell namely from the difference in looking at the measurements is that when your body is out of the seated position, the response is varied between about 100 to 200 Hertz up to two kilohertz.
and when your body is in the seated position, leaning forward or back, the response is closer to the same, but still varies a little bit within that region. However, when your body is out of the seated position, I also noticed a pretty decent difference above nine kilohertz. I will say that when you're measuring, uh, usually above like eight kilohertz for RTA purposes, it gets really touch and go there as well. So you've gotta be mindful of how you're measuring and also make sure you're listening to the music content. And with it being so sparse in music content, I would also advise you possibly to listen to pink noise as well and make the adjustments in EQ that way. Listen, measure, listen, measure, just to make sure that things look all right if you're doing this all manually. I think the obvious question that most of you are gonna have for me is, how do I measure? And honestly, the answer is, a little bit of every way. There really is no wrong or right method. My real key point that I want people to pay attention to and, and the takeaway that I want you to have from this video is that when you're using a target curve, you need to understand how that target curve was derived. Most target curves, and actually every target curve that I've come across is derived based on a free space type measurement. It's not based on somebody else sitting in the seated position, waving a mic in front of their, their self, and then taking out the effects of their body. I don't actually know anyone who's gone through the trouble of doing that. So that means that if you're looking at a target curve that was supplied to you, or you found one online somewhere, like on AVS forum or something, and you downloaded this target curve, there was no body taken into effect. And if you're trying to hit a target curve, you wanna hit that target curve in the same way that it was supplied to you. So ideally, you wouldn't sit in the seated position. You would try to hit that target curve in a free space environment. However, what we've seen in the data is that there's not a huge, huge difference between in seated and free fill type measurement in a room. However, if you're trying to hit a target curve, I would advise you simply to try to hit that target curve in the same way that it was delivered to you. And most likely that means not you in the seated position. But if you're trying to get something real fast, trying to check something out. Maybe you're trying to balance left and right sides and you just wanna you know, sit in the mic and, and take a couple sweeps, that's probably okay. Again, I'm not telling you either way is right or wrong. I'm simply here to provide you with the information that there is a difference between the two. They say knowledge is power, so hopefully today you've gained a little bit of power and if not, keep coming back. We'll try to work through this together. I'm always here to help out and I hope you guys appreciate it. I hope you guys learned something today. And with that said, I'm out. You guys take care. Peace.